It's a great pleasure uh, this evening to be able to introduce uh, a distinguished Haas graduate, uh, 96 grad, John Hankey. He uh, formed a number of uh, companies, uh, I guess in his bio they call him a serial entrepreneur, which is a, which is a, a amusing way of talking about somebody that's kind of restless and, uh, and uh, dynamic and, uh, and bent on uh, living the entrepreneurial style of life. Uh, in 2000, he founded a company called Keyhole, which uh, in 2004 was uh, sold to Google and is now known as Google Earth. Uh, and once again, it's my great pleasure to introduce John Hankey. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's nice to be back on campus. I never really liked that serial entrepreneur term. It sounds like serial killer to me. But I guess you have to be a little bit pathological to keep doing startups, so maybe it's apt. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you guys about kind of how I ended up where I am, um, which is a little bit of a roundabout story, but it started out um, while I was in business school. So I understand you guys are a mixture of, there's undergrads here and grad students here, is that right? In the business and as well as in the engineering programs? So um, yeah, I came to business school uh, back in 1995, you know, maybe like some of you guys, but with, definitely with the idea that I wanted to start a company. That was the whole purpose. And uh, kind of the two years that I spent in business school were really all about kind of figuring out how to do that, because I, I really had no idea. I, uh, did not have a lot of business connections, you know, here in the Valley. I was not from California. I was not from the Bay Area. Um, I originally grew up in Texas and had been living and working on the East Coast. So this was a life move. My wife and I came out here, completely fresh start, complete industry change. But I wanted to pursue something that I was really passionate about, which is software applications that were both entertaining and offered something of, hopefully, of more substantial value to the user in terms of utility or um, uh, learning or what have you. So that's kind of what I want what I wanted to do. Um, so I spent the first year kind of kicking around. I uh, joined Partners for Entrepreneurial Leadership. Does that club still exist? Are there any Pell? You guys even heard of that? No, it's gone. It is. It does still exist. Just nobody's taking this class. Um, so I spent the first year, you know, I joined the club and really sort of figuring out, you know, well, what is a startup? How does a company get started? How does it raise money? How do you hire people? How do you actually, you know, then start building and growing a business? And uh, we had a lot of great speakers, um, but, you know, it was all pretty academic and I was anxious to really kind of get my hands dirty and start kind of doing it rather than just hearing people talk about it. So um, as it turns out, one of my classmates, one of my good friends, um, you know, had the same idea, and uh, he and his brother had actually kind of already identified um, a market they thought was interesting, and they had found a couple of engineers that uh, were interested in this area and had already done some initial work. Uh, the engineers weren't here. There weren't as, you know, uh, good of relations, I guess, between the business school and the engineering school. I mean, the relations weren't bad, it's just they were kind of very separate programs. Um, but there was a guy who was just finishing up, finishing up at MIT and his little brother who was at Virginia Tech. And um, the thing that they were working on was, uh, well, what people now call massively multiplayer online games. Uh, but it was a virtual world, a 3D um, client server architecture where uh, thousands of people could, well, the vision at the time was thousands of people could play together in this 3D space. And it was, the idea was to make a role playing game out of that. So, you know, very common today, some very successful examples of that genre out there. Uh, in 1995, it was a totally novel concept. You know, the internet was really just starting to exist as something that people talked about, knew about, and used. Certainly, the commercial side of things, you know, didn't didn't really exist um, to any uh, significant degree then. So, um, these two brothers, uh, the two engineering brothers, uh, my classmate, uh, were starting this thing up, and um, I joined in with them and. Um, you know, we just sort of figured it out as we went. Um, we, needed, we knew we needed some more people to kind of work on the application. We started figuring out how to, you know, get some money together so that we could hire some contractors. You know, the internet really made the whole thing possible because we were going out on the web, finding people. It's quite a common thing today, but finding engineers, finding artists, finding game designers to start working on this. And, uh, 
you know, at the same time we were learning about capital structures and you know, how to set up a company, how to take in money, how you sort of split everything up in terms of who gets what. Uh, so we kind of immediately you know, put that into practice. Um, it was, uh, I guess we were kind of fortunate that uh, you know, Wilson Sonsini uh, was involved with the school at the time and they kind of did the legal work for free. So we were able to get that corporate structure in place so we could you know, take money from people and um, you know, have, that, have the ownership and everything all be right. Um, so we ended up raising a few hundred thousand dollars, uh, you know, largely from our classmates and from some friends and family. And, uh, you know, we had this team that grew up to around 20 people. And um, we launched a beta, I guess, around the middle of my second year of business school. So that was around December, January, 95, 96. And, uh, you know, it worked. It was, it was really the first uh, game of its kind uh, in terms of being this three-dimensional world where hundreds of people could come in and chat and, you know, play these games together. And, uh, I don't know, we got maybe 50,000 uh, beta testers over the course of the next few months. And then the game publishers started calling us and uh, we sort of, you know, started learning about that whole business of how you publish a game and the royalties and who gets what. Uh, that was a fairly educational experience. As it turns out, it's not such a great thing to be a developer and the publishers, you know, generally get the better end of the bargain. So as we, you know, kind of were figuring out what that looked like, um, some of the companies started talking about just acquiring us as a team. And, um, you know, when we sort of ran the numbers, that really seemed like the, the right thing to do. So uh, just before we graduated, we signed the letter of intent to be acquired by a game company. It was a public company called 3DO. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, they did a hardware console, became a game publisher. It was founded by Trip Hawkins, who also found Electronic Arts. Pretty well-known guy in the game industry. I was really thrilled to be talking to him, you know, even having a conversation with him. Um, and, you know, he ended up buying our company and, um, you know, that was nice. We raised a few hundred thousand dollars, uh, spent almost all of it on programmers, artists and engineers, um, and uh, sold the company for a few million dollars, you know, spread around to our investors uh, and to the folks who worked on the product. It was a nice, you know, little profit. It wasn't, you know, retirement money, but it really whet our appetite for this whole, you know, entrepreneurship thing. So um, we went to work at 3DO, uh, kind of did that corporate thing for about a year, launched our product there, um, and then got the itch to do another company. So uh, myself, Steve Sellers, my classmate, his brother, Mike Sellers, uh, we left and uh, decided to do, do it all over again uh, with a little bit more understanding of how things worked. And we did it on a slightly bigger scale the next time. You know, it wasn't Google scale. Uh, we ended up raising, I don't know, two or three million dollars in total over, uh, you know, two or three different kind of small financing rounds. And uh, we stayed in the general space of games, that's kind of where we, where we were comfortable. So um, we did a Java-based uh, online gaming and chat environment. It was geared towards more casual types of games, so you could go and play chess or checkers or spades, chat with other people, there's probably a lot of flirting and that kind of stuff going on too. Um, and, uh, you know, we grew that company for a while and then had an opportunity to sell it. There was a company that, it's actually the guys that ultimately ended up with um, MySpace. Uh, and it was some guys out of Los Angeles that were buying up kind of different internet companies. And uh, we sold our company to them. That in itself was a learning experience. This company uh, was mostly legitimate, but they had gone public through something called a reverse merger. You may hear people talk about that. That's, you know, normally when a company goes public, you go public with an investment bank on the NASDAQ or whatever. And, uh, you know, that's a sign of being a successful and established company. You know, typically we think about public companies being, you know, successful established enterprises. But there's this other way people can go public, which is on the over the counter, the mar on the over -the -counter market, you can basically buy the shell of a company, insert yourself into it. You can raise money and, you know, there are some legitimate companies that operate in that way. There are a lot of, like, not very legitimate companies that make use of that mechanism. Um, in fact, I had a headhunter call me this morning and asked me if I wanted to be CEO of this OTC company, and it was a very short phone call. <laughs> uh, but normally, if, you know, if you're approached by somebody from, you know, one of these companies, that's, you know, typically something to kind of be wary of. Uh, we didn't know at the time. <laughs> uh, so we engaged with these guys and, um, you know, sold the company. It actually worked out well for us, for our investors. Uh, we sold the company for about 20 probably $25 million. Um, and, you know, we hadn't raised that much money. It was a nice multiple uh, in terms of the return that our investors got and uh, as well as for the employees and, uh, and managers of the company. 
um, did not stay there long, sort of figured out that that wasn't necessarily the corporate culture that was uh, the right place for me, and started looking around for something else. And, um, you know, looked for a while. I did not jump into anything immediately. At that point, I had had some experience with kind of the ups and downs of, you know, doing the startup thing. Uh, and it's definitely, you know, it's an emotionally and physically draining type of experience often. Uh, you know, I suppose you can be really fortunate as Google was and raise a bunch of money, you know, $20 million and just have nothing but good times. But usually there are some bumps along the road and certainly we had experienced those in these prior two companies. Uh, you know, coming out of business school with the first company, um, it was, you know, working at home, uh, not, you know, paying ourselves very much money and just really not really knowing where the next kind of payroll was going to come from. And we had had a little bit of that, of these sort of dry spells where we raise some money, kind of run out of money, go out and raise some more with the second company. So, you know, my takeaway from that, and I guess one of the things that I would, you know, impart to you guys is, you know, when you decide to do a startup, and I hope that many of you will, you know, choose carefully. Because uh, it's a really serious decision. It's not quite like getting married, uh, but it's almost like that. And uh, it's going to be the kind of thing where you're really going to be tested and you're going to be asking yourselves, you know, do I really want to do this? You know, why am I here? Is it really worth it? You're going to have those real gut check moments. And if the idea is not one that you really believe in and are really passionate about, you may not have the right answer, you know, whenever you have those uh, moments of doubt. So, you know, find something that you really believe in that you think is going to change the world in whatever way. It doesn't necessarily have to be a billion dollar economic opportunity. There are lots of ways you can change the world, but have it be something that you care about in a way that isn't just financial success or what your friends are going to think or what's, you know, what's going to go on your resume, but something that's really important to you. So I was lucky enough to stumble on uh, some technology that some guys have been working on that, you know, when I saw it, it was one of those uh, moments where you just get, you know, chills up your spine. Um, and it was some, a couple of engineers had come out of Silicon Graphics, uh, which is barely around as a company anymore, but when I was in business school, that's where everybody wanted to go and work. It was the Google of its day. Uh, high-end visualization, many hundreds of thousands of dollars for these um, 3D workstations. And um, these engineers have been working there uh, doing visualization of basically large images, which is somewhat challenging to do uh, when you're using hardware accelerator graphics. And um, they had left uh, with the intention of starting a company um, to do a, kind of a middleware platform for video game development, to make it simpler for developers to make a game that would run on Sony's platform, Microsoft's platform, Nintendo's platform. But as a byproduct of that work and um, kind of an outgrowth of their experience at Silicon Graphics, they had created this, uh, a software technique, uh, which is a patented technique, um, to basically visualize very large, essentially infinitely sized images using hardware accelerated graphics, with very smooth types of interactivity. So I saw a very early demo of that. And um, it was something that looks a lot like Google Earth today. Uh, it was a globe textured with an image where you could zoom into a city. And it was just a demo. There was just one small uh, chip of high resolution imagery at the time. And it was all carefully loaded and packaged onto this very specially configured PC. But it was a PC. It wasn't a Silicon Graphics workstation. And, um, you know, it was pretty stunning. And I started talking with these guys about, you know, what they wanted to do with it and kind of what was going on. And basically, it was kind of a hack, kind of a demo that had been put together, and they needed to get rid of it because it didn't fit with their business plan of developing this application development environment for video games. And their board, the VCs that invested in them, were saying, hey, guys, you know, this is not what you're supposed to be doing. This is a distraction. Get rid of it. And uh, so, you know, they felt like something was there, uh, but it wasn't something they could pursue. And so, you know, our conversation was about how do we, how do we take this technology and move it forward? And um, so we set up a company to do that. That was not the company that these guys were doing. That company was called Keyhole. And uh, we managed to painfully extricate that from this, this company that these guys were doing to do, do the video game stuff and um, get it funded. So this was in you know, uh, from basically 2000 to 2001. Um, and we were kind of getting this thing initially set up. It was really the latter sort of part of the first kind of dot-com 
boom at the time. We weren't to the bubble stage yet. Nobody sort of knew there was a bubble. It was just a boom. And uh, companies were getting funded right and left, uh, large amounts of money. The whole strategy was the pets.com kind of model of get as much money as you can, spin it as fast as you can, get to scale, and you know, you figure out everything else later. So we should have known better, but you know, it's easy to kind of deceive yourselves in environments like that. So we more or less followed that model. We went out and raised about $5 million, um, started this company, and then just started spending that money. You know, we felt like we had a good idea. We wanted to bring it to market. Um, we had contacts at this company called Excite at Home, which also isn't around anymore, but was instrumental in bringing, you know, the first sort of wave of broadband rollout. So we thought, you know, Excite at Home, they're going to distribute this application, we were imagining all of these uses for this technology, which if any of you are users of Google Earth or kind of read about what's happening in that space today, they're familiar uses, you know, real estate and travel and all that. So we were really excited about that opportunity. Uh, so we just kind of went and, you know, we hired a big team and those millions just started, you know, draining out of the bank account at a pretty rapid clip. Um, the problem was that, you know, roughly six months after we raised that money, um, the musical chair game just it kind of stopped. Uh, the NASDAQ dropped by about a third uh, over the course of a month there in April, May. Um, third, anyway, it was, it, was a, it was, the chart goes down a lot. And uh, funding stopped. You know, these VCs that have been just dumping, you know, $10 million, $20 million into, you know, basically ideas, you know, a few people with an idea. Um, all of a sudden, in the course of a few months, really went into this crisis mode because the IPO, you know, the exit dried up, so they weren't able to cash out on these companies that weren't making any money. And they're faced then with this big problem because they've got a bunch of companies that have huge burn rates and there's no end in sight. So they, they, you know, the transition was to salvage mode, like which ones of these companies can we save and which ones should we shut down and how do we stop the bleeding, basically. So that was a problem for us because, you know, our whole model had been raise $5 million, spend it in a year and then raise our Series B and then spend that and then, you know, our future will become clear, you know, over time as we're going through this process. But, um, you know, it became pretty obvious when this, the meltdown happened that we weren't going to be able to raise more money. So, um, you know, then we had to think really hard about, hey, what really is our business? And, you know, just sort of opening up uh, online and, and giving your stuff away for free uh, isn't necessarily going to allow us to continue to do this cool thing that we're doing. So, um, you know, we really had to, at that point, kind of fundamentally change directions. And we, you know, went from being a very consumer-focused project to being one that was much more focused on business customers that could pay us real money. So we, um, you know, one of the few times that I put some of my MBA sort of training uh, to work and we went out and looked at different markets and kind of looked where the opportunity might be and uh, found commercial real estate as a promising market for this kind of technology. People that could really benefit from it in their day-to-day -day work and that had, you know, budgets to pay for this kind of thing. And so we totally redirected towards that market and actually launched at launched what is now Google Earth at a commercial real estate show in Dallas, Texas in the summer of 2001. About five months after that, we had small amounts of revenue, but not enough to cover our, uh, our burn. And uh, we had what I've referred to as the board meeting that no entrepreneur, no CEO ever wants to have. That is a board meeting where you meet with your board and you decide whether you're going to shut the company down or not. And we were literally at the point where we did not have money in the bank to make the next payroll. So it was coming up in about two weeks. And uh, my investors were extremely nervous at the time. Um, I had a corporate uh, VC that was an investor, and they're very concerned about the pass-through of liability. Um, if you keep people working for you uh, with the expectation that they're going to get paid and you don't actually have the funds to pay them, uh, that the liability for that can pass through the corporate veil and land on the, the shoulders of the directors. So it was a serious deal. You know, we had people, and we really had to decide whether to send people home that day or not. And, um, you know, we could see our dream coming to a very, very uh, fast end. Um, we managed to find a way not to do that. And it involved basically figuring out um, a way to radically reduce our costs, which was basically to ask people to work for 
all or some uh, amount of, uh, or to work for stock and only a small amount of uh, cash compensation. So we actually drew up a little um, form and uh, I went around and met with everybody in the company. We're probably 30 people at the time. And we gave people a choice to take you know, so much stock and zero salary, so much stock, and 25% of their salary, so much stock, and 50% of their salary. And uh, you know, a lot of people said, yeah, you know, we love what we're doing. We're really committed to this idea. We think it's going to be a really big thing someday. We believe in it. And so, you know, well, I, I don't, you know, a lot of the guys were single. They didn't necessarily have dependents. And uh, several people worked for free. A lot of people worked for just, just whatever they needed to pay their bills. So we did that. And uh, some of the founders reached into our pocket and put in a little bit more money to, tr to keep the doors open. And uh, we kind of made it through that little crisis. Um, we went on a few more months, our revenues grew a little bit, but basically found ourselves kind of right back in the same situation. You know, whenever you have $200,000, $250,000 going out the door every month to pay for rent, to pay for salaries, it's kind of, it's hard to keep that going no matter how bad, you know, you want it to work. If you don't have that kind of money, if you don't have a few million in the bank, you, you can't just, you know, materialize a quarter million dollars every month when you need it. So uh, we found ourselves, you know, down to zero again uh, after a couple months. And um, again, you know, the strength of the idea saved us. Uh, as it turns out, uh, the CEO of NVIDIA, which is a big uh, chip company, very successful company making 3D hardware accelerated graphics, saw our application and he got really excited about it because he saw it driving the need for 3D to be in every PC. At the time, most PCs didn't have the nice, fabulous graphics that you get on any $500 commodity PC that you would buy today. So um, he uh, decided to chip in uh, half a million dollars uh, to uh, you know, further this idea along. Um, I'm not sure he was totally clear on the fact that that $500,000 really didn't get us very far down the road, but um, you know, we managed to convince him that our revenues were increasing and that you know, with a little bit of cash, we could make it. And we did for a few more months. And, uh, <laughs> and so that was roughly, you know, that was towards the end of 2001. In 2002, about midway through, um, you know, again, we find ourselves uh, out of money and really scratching our heads and trying to figure out how we can keep this thing going. Uh, another kind of angel uh, came our way. Uh, in this case, it was a Japanese distributor who also loved our product. You know, again, it was this product that just people knew something good had to happen with it. So uh, this Japanese distributor really wanted the rights to market our product in Japan. And uh, I managed to convince him somehow to basically prepay us royalties for the product. Uh, and we got another half a million, half a million dollars in from him. And um, and you know, he actually did well with the product over the next several years. Uh, but um, that got us by for a few more months. Um, by the way, I had two kids at the time. And uh, you know, uh, one of my Haas classmates had joined. He was at um, Netscape, and things had kind of gone downhill there. He had jumped over and joined the company. He also had two kids. Um, and you know, this was, uh, that was probably one of the hardest things for me, was kind of feeling that pass through of responsibility for these men and women that were needed to support their families, basically. And um, you know, it's one thing to be really brave and say, yeah, we can do it, you know, and let's, let's just suck it up and you know, uh, not pay ourselves and you know, we can make this work. But, um, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's one thing to kind of give those speeches to your team and to you know, really get people fired up. But you really kind of have to look deep down inside when you know, you're looking at those people eye to eye, like I'm looking at you here now, and I'm going to convince you to stay and to you know, drop your pay by a half or 75%. And you know, you've got two kids at home, and I know that. And I know that it's going to put you in a serious bind if this thing doesn't work out. So you know, it was not really a pleasant time. But you know, I guess the other kind of upside of being an entrepreneur and putting yourselves in those kinds of situations is, you know, that's a terrific opportunity to really grow and develop as a person. I mean, you know, you're going to get exposed to pressures and have to make decisions and have to step up as a leader in that kind of a small company environment that, you know, in a large company like Google today, you know, 14,000 people or whatever, very few people in Google feel that kind of um, 
it's not really just pressure, but that kind of real responsibility, that real sense of ownership where you know it's like it's going to happen with me and you know a few colleagues here or it's not going to happen at all. So, you know, I guess the, you know, the benefit of all of that was, you know, I feel like that was probably the most kind of personal development, the most intense personal development that I've been through at any point in my life. Um, so we raised the money from our Japanese friends, got by a few more months, and um, then had another hiccup, um, which turned out to be actually a really good thing. We um, were going to do a deal with CNN. So our fame, in kind of a small, small case F fame, uh, was, gain, was growing a little bit. So people were beginning to know about this application called Keyhole. Word was beginning to spread. Um, again, on the strength of the technology, uh, we, some friends decided to just help us out. John Gage, who's a Cal guy, who was one of the original founders of Sun Microsystems, uh, found out about um, Keyhole, thought it was really cool. So he started telling his friends about it. And uh, as it turns out, uh, you know, people like that go to important places. He went to the uh, Davos event, which was held in New York City that year. That was after 9-11. Um, and uh, anyway, he told his friend who was the CEO of Time Warner that, hey, there's this really cool technology. Uh, that led to a conversation ultimately with CNN. And they were really excited about it because they felt like this could really help them tell these stories about things that were happening in various places around the world. So um, we had it set up so that CNN was going to pay us about $300,000 for an enterprise version of our software. So we were going to package up the server and the client and some data. We were going to deploy it with them. $300,000 was a lot of money to us. That was you know, going to pay basically our burn for a month, month and a half. And I was absolutely banking on it. And um, unfortunately, you know, Time Warner is going through a lot of upheavals this time period. And they, at the last minute, literally, the contract was negotiated. It was all we needed is a signature. And they said, yeah, we can't do it. I'm really sorry. Our budget's gone. Oh, we just don't have it. We love your software. We still want to use it. Um, would you be willing to give it to us if we uh, you know, put some type of attribution on screen while we use your software? And uh, self-control is a virtue. And I've, I've learned a tiny bit of it you know, over the past few years. My initial reaction was, you know, no, you know, this is, <laughs> this is not going to work. Uh, I can't pay my employees with uh, attribution. But, um, you know, I thought about it. I actually talked to uh, another Haas classmate, a friend of mine who wasn't with my company at a dinner party at, at my house. And uh, I told him what was going on. He was like, dude, that's an incredible opportunity. You need to go back to them right away and say yes to that. Um, and it kind of gradually dawned on me that that might be a really good thing. So. I went back to them, we said yes, we did the deal. I think they paid us a token amount of money, maybe $10,000, $15,000. And then I once again you know, was on the lookout for where can I get some more money to keep this thing going. And uh, I went back to some of my Haas uh, classmates, uh, a few other friends and family, and we put together uh, basically an angel investment round. Uh, and it was another few hundred thousand dollars. You know, believe me, you know, living hand to mouth like that is not the way to do it. So. <laughs> If you can get, you know, don't overdo it, but if you can get enough, you know, a few million dollars so that you have six months or a year of runway, infinitely better than, you know, having to figure out how to, you know, bring enough money into the door to keep going every few months. Uh, but we did this friends and family round. We got some money in. I put some more money into the company. You know, I'm digging deep at this point. You know, I had gone into business school with a little bit of savings, had made some money in these earlier companies. But basically, it's an all-in game at this point. It's, you know, this company is... That's, that's everything. And um, so, uh, so we, 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 we sort of stabilized for a few months. And um, then we got our, really a lifeline uh, from a kind of unusual source. Um, you know, the market's still down. The, the environment for investing in the Valley was um, uh, still wretched during this time. This was basically 2002, 2003. Uh, but NQTEL was this new little venture capital firm that was basically a government VC firm with uh, money from the intelligence community. So that was one of the few funds in the Valley that was doing real business. And they were making a lot of investments at the time. Uh, this was in the kind of post 9-11 security ramp up uh, period. And uh, so they found out about our technology and uh, invested a few million dollars in the company. And, you know, that was really kind of the turning point for us. And that did give us you know, basically 10 months, a year of runway. Um, shortly after that, CNN kind of kicked into full gear. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, a number of things happened, you know, most of them bad. You know, the war broke out, uh, the space shuttle blew up, a uh, ferry sank. Uh, but anytime when these bad things happen, you know, there was our software on CNN with the, with the logo. So, um, you know, we, we managed to kind of get the company um, on its feet and uh, get stabilized. And um, things actually started going pretty well for us. So. Uh, we were well on our way to becoming break-even uh, in terms of our revenue. We were kind of really doing it in terms of making uh, as much as we were spending. And uh, the revenue was getting to scale, so we were uh, on our way to, um, this was in 2003, we did about $5 million that year. Um, and uh, we were becoming pretty well known globally. The CNN relationship ended up being you know, hugely valuable to us because CNN is you know, it's a global thing. It's not just a US thing. And so we got leads in from all over the world and really established ourselves as you know, a leader in this kind of technology. The other thing, I guess, that helped us kind of ironically was that um, you know, the investment environment was dead. So in the height of the dot-com boom, any good idea you know, within weeks, it seemed like, had three or four clones. So if Kleiner did a company in a certain space, then Sequoia would do a company doing the same thing. And so you would have a very intensely competitive environment where you'd have lots of companies getting funded at the same time to do basically the same thing. Um, that stopped whenever the bubble burst. And so during this period where we were kind of grinding it out and making it, there were no other companies that jumped into our space. So we had this nice kind of vacuum uh, because you know, there just wasn't any money uh, you know, being invested by traditional VCs. So I think, you know, in retrospect, having that kind of breathing space was also really kind of critical to our extending our kind of technology lead over other people and uh, just having enough room to kind of be the player in that space for a while without a lot of competition. Um, so that was kind of where things were in going into 2004. And 2004, things started to turn around. The Valley woke up. VCs decided that, you know, the world wasn't over. They had, you know, stopped the bleeding, they had closed down some of those funds and uh, sort of dealt with that mess, and now we're ready to start over, start new funds, and start investing again. And within a few months, the first quarter of uh, 2004, we had three term sheets uh, on the table, and the term sheet is, you know, you talk to VCs, you do your pitch, they say, yeah, we're interested, come talk to us some more, but the real deal is when they give you a term sheet. That means we're, going, we're, we're committing to invest this amount of money in the following terms. We get this much of the company, we get these rights, we get these number of board seats, et cetera. So that's kind of, you know, that's, that's a pretty definitive thing when you get the term sheet. So we had gone from not being able to raise any you know, significant amount of money for a long time to having our choice of three different investors. Uh, the, round, the round was gonna be uh, eight to $10 million in capital. So you know, more than twice the amount that we had raised before um, at a good valuation, and uh, things were, you know, it was great. We felt like we had finally made it through. Uh, we as a team had, you know, been through a huge amount together. We're very close at that point. Um, and then we got a call from a business development person at Google that said, we've heard about your technology. We'd like to take a look at it. Why don't you come in and talk to us? So as it turns out, we were actually just a few blocks away from Google. We were right in the Shoreline Park area uh, in Mountain View. And we had heard a little bit about Google, but we didn't really know much about the company. You know, this was before Google's IPO, and if, I don't know if you guys were around, if any of you were around the Valley at that time, but Google was very secretive in its, you know, before they went public. Uh, of course, they're a search company and people knew their products, but people knew very little about what was happening inside the company. We heard rumors about chefs making these gourmet meals and masseuses giving massages to people. And it all sounded very suspicious because, you know, we thought all that had ended, you know, with the dot-com bubble bursting. But this was somehow still going on at Google. So uh, a little bit curious about that. And, you know, we knew Larry and Sergey, and we had heard that they had had, you know, difficulty getting experienced technology managers to join the company because it was such a wild and, you know, crazy and unsort of managed environment. So I didn't know what to think about it. I was, I was actually very wary. Uh, but we, we went in, we did the pitch, and uh, the next day, I'm in my car, and the biz dev person calls and says, hey, we really liked it, you know, we want to buy you guys. What do you say? And uh, 
I had already signed the, one of the, the term sheets. So that's kind of a, that's not quite, you know, getting married and getting the ring on your finger, but that's, you know, you're almost there when you sign the term sheet. It's a, kind of a moral commitment that you're going to take the money. I explained this. I explained what we had been through and that, you know, it was basically a done deal and we felt like we could build a really big successful company. And, you know, I don't know if any of you have been through an acquisition, acquisitions don't happen overnight, you know. Uh, they typically draw out for several months. There's a ton of negotiation about terms and not just how much, but stock or cash and earnouts and non-competes and they're messy things. And uh, we were broke. I mean, we had uh, three VCs that wanted to give us, you know, a lot of money, but we didn't have any money in the bank. So it was, you know, it, I, I was very confused as to what to do. and. Uh, we uh, started a series of meetings with the founders, the engineering, you know, leaders, and um, we're just trying to figure out, you know, should we do this thing with Google? It sounds kind of interesting. Uh, Google had shared with us some confidential numbers uh, in terms of what they were doing with revenue, what their search uh, query volume was, and, you know, frankly, it blew our minds. And, you know, a lot of people pre-Google IPO had no idea that the company was you know, basically minting money as a private company. Very, very profitable. Uh, so that caused us to really seriously consider it. But at the same time, it looked pretty good to take, you know, what to us looked like a lot of money and build our own company. And, you know, we had a lot invested in it at that point, emotionally, psychologically. Um, I mean, we really were, you know, partners and owners of the company. And the idea of then, you know, taking this nice pool of venture money and driving that forward and, and growing it into something much bigger and much more successful was very attractive to us. Uh, a lot of debate. Ultimately, we decided to sell to Google. Um, and uh, in hindsight, it was absolutely the right thing to do, but it in, in no way seemed like an obvious decision when we were in the middle of it. Um, before we ended up, you know, we negotiated the terms of the deal. Before we got the deal closed, Google went public. I think it was $120 a share. It immediately dropped to 85. You know, my heart, you know, leapt. I'm like, oh God, we're doing the wrong thing here. Uh, but then it went back up again, and you know, just kind of kept going. So uh, we uh, we got the deal closed, and then started going down this road uh, to pursue the vision that had sold us on the Google deal, and that was to take our nice little technology, which had some, you know, lowercase fame in the world but to take that out to you know, what we knew would be millions of users. We didn't know at the time it would be hundreds of millions of users, but we couldn't think in terms of that large, but you know, millions was huge. Uh, and so we, we started down the path of, um, of doing that. So <clears throat> that's kind of how Keyhole became part of Google. I'm just gonna take a few minutes, and I guess there are a couple of slides here. Sorry for the goofy uh, guy in the picture there, but uh, we're basically just getting the call at this point from Google that the deal was closed. So that was, that was after, they made the offer to us to buy us in May. And um, you know, as these things go, it didn't end up closing until October. So uh, really stressful through. <laughs> through this whole period of, you know, are we going to get this thing closed? Is this all going to fall apart? They had lent us a little money so that we could, um, so that we could, <laughs> so that we could keep paying the bills. But, um, I mean, it's hairy. When you're, trying to, when you're trying to close one of these deals, you want to be a tough negotiator. You know, you don't want to get into non-competes that, you know, are oppressive. You don't want to be on the hook for future liabilities if, you know, something's found to be wrong with the technology. There are lots of gotchas, you know, in these deals. It's not like they just give you the check and shake your hand and it's, you know, it's all done. So, um, you know, you want to do the right thing. At the same time, you know, we didn't have any money in the bank. And uh, it's, you know, the feeling was this could fall through at any time, and I'd already said no to the VC, so I had taken the term sheet that they had already signed and given to me and done the very rude thing of basically not taking their money. So it would have been you know, very embarrassing uh, to go back to them and then ask to kind of do that deal. Uh, and they might not have said yes, I don't know. Uh, but it did all work out. So um, that's a photo of the team. That's the Google Earth team, the Keyhole group, just a few months after we were acquired by Google. 
we were about 30 people um, at the time the deal closed. So since then, um, things have just gone beyond my wildest expectations in terms of fulfilling on, you know, what the technology could become. Uh, you know, there was a great granule of capability there, but to fully exploit it, we needed all of the resources of Google. We needed the server infrastructure, we needed the additional engineering oomph of Google, and we needed the resources to really fill our product with um, information, with imagery, in part. So we were able, um, with Larry and Sergey's, uh, actually Sergey approved this deal in his office one day, um, sort of summarily, to um, partner with Digital Globe, uh, which operates the world's highest resolution commercial imaging satellite, the only satellite of its type. And um, so we had been working with Digital Globe to get a little bit of data for you know, a few cities around the world. And uh, after we were acquired by Google, I went to Sergey and said, you know, we could get a lot more of this data. You know, we could get this area and this area, and we could probably do the top cities, maybe the top 200 cities around the world. And Sergey said, well, how much do they have? And I said, well, you know, they've got a lot. And uh, I had a chart that showed, you know, all the coverage that they have all around the world. And he said, well, I think we should get it all. <laughs> and uh, so that was a new idea to me, you know, coming from this living hand to mouth type of attitude. And so we did. We went back to the company and we said, well, we've changed our minds. We want it all. And uh, they were kind of surprised. Uh, but we did that deal and we ended up getting basically every usable pixel that came off the satellite and for the past uh, sort of three years or so into the deal at this point. So now we have coverage over um, a huge part of the world. Uh, we also have data from airplanes. Um, but we have imagery coverage that's, for high resolution coverage is over a third of the landmass of the Earth. High resolution being imagery that shows structures, that shows houses, buildings, uh, sub-meter imagery. So it's over uh, a third of the landmass, over half of the population of the world can go to Google Earth, Google Maps, and zoom down and see their house in our products. So really wonderful to have the support of a company like Google in terms of bringing this stuff to its kind of full potential. That's, one of, that's a map of our coverage, and you can see uh, places like Latin America, Africa, India, the Middle East, Australia, uh, towards Japan. We've got coverage of um, far more coverage globally than any of our competitors. And uh, it was really Sergey's willingness to say, we're about organizing the world's information. We're not about making a mapping product. We imagine geography as a way to help people find all kinds of things. And so they really believed it was important and were willing to invest in it beyond just buying a uh, keyhole. We've taken that down now to street level. Has anybody here tried Street View, by the way? Street View? So uh, now we're imaging with these panoramic cameras. Uh, these uh, Basically, um, every five feet or so, we get one of these high resolution panoramic images. You can drop down and basically navigate even within the images. You can go forward, back, turn left and right at street corners and get, you know, very uh, high fidelity images of stores and parks and museums and all kinds of interesting things. Um, we're very aggressively building this out. So this is a pirate, this is an unofficial pirate photo of our um, Street View collection fleet. Uh, this is taken in a Google parking lot uh, by a blogger who wasn't supposed to be there, I took this picture. <laughs> uh, but these are our cars, so we now have lots of them uh, basically all across the US collecting this type of imagery. Um, so the other thing that we did that worked out really well was also kind of accidental, is we put out some very rudimentary tools to allow people to annotate things on top of the images. And uh, so the question we asked ourselves is, you know, people using Google Earth, over a thousand human lifetimes have now been spent, people sitting in front of the Google Earth client and using the application. So if you, if you have that and you give people then the ability to make some annotations, you know, what happens when you do that? You get, good stuff, you get bad stuff, useful things annotated, not useful things. Well, you get some like not especially useful things. So, you know, one of the first things that happened is somebody figured out that in the Netherlands, people like to lay out in the sun and they don't wear any clothes when they're doing it. And they're like in the picture. So all those little photos, that, that got annotated right away. I have the lowest common denominator of human behavior. Um, <laughs> But um, then other like really interesting things started happening. So um, this uh, person in um, Italy uh, who is an amateur archaeologist and also a Google Earth fan noticed this weird anomaly uh, in a piece of farmland near where he lived. 
and uh, went out and um, engaged some real archaeologists and uh, told them about this. They started investigating. They did a little dig. And sure enough, it was an ancient Roman villa that was previously undiscovered. Uh, very cool. And Google Earth was a starting point for that. Um, it's really changed the dynamic in terms of uh, international security. So uh, all uh, through Israel um, last week, uh, front page news, Google Earth, because we published some new imagery of Israel. By law, the imagery in Israel is downsampled to two meters per pixel. So it's not as clear as it is in other places. That's a very unique law, US law, that's, that was passed specifically at Israel's request. But um, in any case, there are nuclear reactors. Uh, were um, visible and people tagged them almost immediately. This is another example of that. So this is China's latest uh, submarine. This is a ballistic missile carrying submarine. Uh, you know, a few years ago, um, you know, there would have been rumors of its existence and probably people in the Pentagon would have these kinds of photos. In today's world, it's on the internet and somebody tagged it almost immediately uh, when it showed up in a digital globe image. Um, and then, you know, people started doing really interesting um, and not just interesting, but obviously really useful things with the product. So it's not just kind of things that caught their eye, but they started extending it. So um, this was an early example in Santiago. We had beautiful imagery of the city, but we didn't have a lot of additional mapping information. People rely on public transportation very heavily in Santiago. So somebody immediately mapped the subway system in Google Earth, and then they shared that on this community sharing site that we have. Uh, their, uh, uh, friends over in Buenos Aires uh, upped them. They actually mapped out everything in the city. So all of the roads, all of the public transit, and they even included 3D buildings with um, SketchUp right away. So this, uh, the great thing about this kind of user um, annotation, user generated content generally, is that it's completely horizontal. You don't do, it doesn't happen market by market or area by area. It happens everywhere all at once. And because we had imagery of the whole world, you know, thanks to um, Google support and Sergey's um, you know, vision there. Um, these annotations started happening all around the world as well. Uh, we've extended that now to Google Maps. People can annotate in Google Maps. We've had over 4.8 million of these uh, annotated maps created um, in the Google Maps product just since it was launched a few months ago. The, the annotation part was launched just a few months ago. Crazy stuff. This is punk, punk rock in London, but you know, tourist guides to Costa Rica, travel guides to many cities around the world. Um, Amazing content. This is the Costa Rica example. And uh, we use this data to enrich our search results. So basically, it means that people can search for things in Google Maps, Google Earth, that um, extend far beyond the original vision of those products. The original idea was that you could find a business. So if you want to find a hotel or a restaurant, you could search in the product. What this user annotated content has done is extend that to include hiking trails, you know, biking trails, uh, music venues. Um, basically, all the things that people really go out and do in the world, people are annotating them. So it's greatly extended the power um, of that search. Uh, we took that um, in um, a slightly different direction uh, with the acquisition of a small company called Panoramio um, earlier this year. So this is a site where people can take their digital photographs and use the map to very specifically geolocate them. So this proved to be um, also a really uh, popular activity. We now have millions of these geolocated photos. So you can um, pull up these at any place in the world. Are we uh, yeah, we're just at the end of our time here? Yeah. OK. Well, I'll stop talking then. I didn't realize I had chewed up our whole class. OK. All right, just a few more slides. Uh, so we bought a company called uh, SketchUp. It was fun for me because I got to be on the buying side after I got into Google. So we've now acquired several companies. We bought a company called SketchUp that lets people make 3D buildings themselves. And uh, just all over the world, people are modeling their cities. Lahore, uh, Pakistan, that was one example. This is what Denver now looks like. Uh, Tokyo, even Kabul. This blew my mind when I saw this. Like, who modeled all these beautiful 3D textured buildings in Afghanistan? Uh, but the, you know, the great thing about the tools is they're accessible to everybody. Uh, this is just outside of uh, Hong Kong, I believe. It's a famous Buddha, the Lantau Buddha. Uh, so you get these great cultural landmarks that um, might not have thought to cover. If Google were doing it systematically, we probably wouldn't have anticipated the need to model this. But because users are doing the modeling, they can choose what deserves this level of attention. We did a Model Your Campus competition that worked really well with college campuses around the country. Um, I think Stanford, we had eight winners. I think Stanford won. I don't think Cal was a winner, unfortunately. 
Um, and all of that user content um, looks like this when you plot it out on a map. So this, uh, this was another mind-blowing moment whenever we generated this a, a few months ago uh, for the first time. We rendered this out in May, and we looked at all of the user annotations that we had um, in our database. And so this is, this is not a heat map. These are just individual uh, points plotted in all of the places where we have um, user annotations. So um, amazingly rich annotation of the world. And then the product, because it, it's not just, it's, the, the product ended up being used in ways that we never anticipated. I guess I'll just say it that way. Uh, when Katrina happened in New Orleans, uh, the Coast Guard was using Google Earth and Craigslist to basically find where people were trapped and send helicopters in to rescue them. Kind of crazy, you would think, well, the government, they've got lots of sophisticated software, but as it turns out, web software that's available that already has the data in it, it's ready, easy to use, uh, a breakthrough, really. Um, used in the earthquake in Pakistan. Uh, used by this guy to protect his tribal land. Just a couple more slides here, but the blue dot is uh, where he, he lives. That's his tribe uh, in Brazil. And uh, they don't want people to log it. Uh, you can understand why he's concerned if you look at the area around where you see the sort of whitish pattern. That's fishbone, uh, basically uh, very aggressive logging. So all around this guy's uh, tribal land is basically being wiped out. So they're using GIS tools and Google Earth to mount a public relations campaign as well as to monitor their land in terms of what's happening there. Uh, and we did something with the Holocaust Museum earlier this year where we, um, they, using Google Earth, created this layer showing what was happening in the Sudan in Darfur. So if you look carefully here, you'll see these things, these little circles all over that image. So each of those circles is the physical, uh, the perimeter of a hut. So uh, these are grass-roofed uh, dwellings, and they've been burned down. So the only thing that's left after they're burned is this uh, circumference of the structure. So um, the on-the-ground images and the stories from the refugees tied with that um, satellite image proved to be you know, a really powerful way to get the message out in terms of what was happening. In fact, it was shown to President Bush. He toured the Holocaust Museum and was shown this demo. This is him looking at Google Earth. Uh, in the museum, and he made the statement afterwards, no one who sees these pictures can doubt that genocide is the only word for what is happening to our four, and that we have a moral obligation to stop it. And he took action on that um, in terms of um, getting peacekeepers um, into the region and formally declaring it a genocide. So um, it's been incredibly gratifying to see the impact that these um, tools that we started a long time ago, not really know knowing how it would all work out, have had. And um, that's it. Uh, So Google is big, and we're not hiring quite as fast as we used to be hiring, but we're still hiring engineers and product managers. So um, if you're interested in talking more about working at Google, feel free to email me. This is my email address there. Thank you very much. Questions? We can do that. Two questions. OK, you guys have to pick who, All right. who we'll asks. Take, we'll take two questions here. So first hands up, and I'll pick you. Yeah. Um, recently, Um, <clears throat> well, we're watching that, you know, pretty carefully. There's not a lot I can say about that. Um, you know, we work with both those uh, entities right now. We have contracts that extend uh, some distance into the future. And, uh, you know, we're looking at those relationships and uh, figuring out uh, how we can ensure our ability to continue to offer our products. Yeah. I'm sorry, I completely dodged that, but <laughs> it's, it's a fairly sensitive thing, so. Yeah, you know, um, again, I think the environment was tough, but it helped us in the sense that there, wasn't, there weren't very many places for people to go. You know, uh, I mean, no, nobody was hiring, no com new companies were getting formed. So, um, you, know, the, you know, people were willing to stick it out. Had it been a different environment where somebody could have left and gotten money somewhere else or whatever, there might have been more of that. But as it was, uh, the key people 
for the most part, stuck it out, and we didn't have a big problem with that. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks very much.